Thank you very much, Dr. Fay, for an excellent and thought-provoking presentation. I thought maybe I could kick us off. Dr. Fay, you mentioned the importance of establishing cutoff values. What is the cutoff for PCT that you're currently using in your medical center? That's a great question, and I get that question quite a lot. And what we use at Stanford is 0 0.5 as a cutoff. If it's less than 0 0.5, we simply report the result, and it's not flagged as abnormal because the reference range is shown as less than 0 0.5. If it's greater than 0 0.5, we report the result, and we add a comment that this result may signal increased risk of severe sepsis, but additional testing is indicated. And I'm working independently with the target groups of physicians in the intensive care units, both at Stanford Hospital Clinics, and I will be working with the people in, at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. We are not advising them to order the test yet because we're still trying to establish what our cutoffs will be for the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. But for older children in the pulmonary intensive care unit, we, we use the same cutoff as we do at Stanford for the adult patients in the intensive care unit, which is 0 0.5. Here's another question before we go to verbal questions that I thought was really interesting. The person asks, how did you actually bring the test into your facility? What was the process you went through? Oh, it was just like any other test that we look at. Either we or, or the physicians are interested in a new test. We don't dive in. We <laughs> we're very conservative at Stanford, actually. We're, we're often the last on the block to implement a new test, but this is one exception maybe. But we think about it, we talk about it, and then we look at it and we do the you know traditional validation. If it seems like it's reproducible, robust, has precision and has accuracy, we implement it with babysitting. And the babysitting is in part what I mentioned before, before we publicize that it's orderable, I meet with the target groups get their feedback, and then we eventually publish a notice about it in the laboratory newsletter that has not yet happened for procalcitonin. It will happen within the next month or so, but the people who are working in the intensive care units already know that they can order it. All right. Here's another question, Dr. Fay. Are you currently screening all of your ICU admissions? No, we're not. In fact, I gave a webinar last year in which I said that we were planning to include procalcitonin as part of a sepsis panel a order set, which we were implementing, we still have not implemented that order set, actually. This is meant to be something that the nurse can order without needing to consult the physician if the nurse feels that the patient, based on a series of observations, including vital signs and, and other criteria, that the patient is deteriorating in the ICU. And I'm sort of hoping that PCT will be included on that order set, but we still haven't implemented that order set. So actually, we are getting procalcitonin ordered from patients in the intensive care unit, but as is often the case in medicine, it's, it's pretty much individual physicians deciding to order it. Okay. The question, and I apologize to the sender if I'm going to misinterpret this, but it says, do you report this out quantitatively? Yes, we give the number, and as I said, if, if it's less than 0 0.5 nanograms per mil, we simply give the number and there's... There's no other indication of what that means. If it's above 0 0.5, we include the comment that I mentioned earlier that this result may signal increased risk of severe sepsis. Thank you. Sergio, do we have any verbal questions? Kirsten Springer, please go ahead. Hi, I have a question. Were most of the studies done on the requirement to have a bacteremia with severe sepsis septic shock, or is it the clinical definition? Because I have a lot of patients, severe sepsis septic shock, without bacteremia on positive blood cultures, but have other positive cultures, for instance, respiratory, C. diff colitis, urinary tract infections, but they do progress on to clinical definition of severe septic, septic shock that have positive procalcitonin. So I was wondering if the studies were done requiring positive blood cultures or were they clinical presentation? Actually, what you said is really true that sepsis, although many people think that sepsis means bacteremia, it doesn't at all. Probably most of the patients who develop sepsis in the hospital will have pneumonia or maybe a urinary tract infection. They probably have bacteremia, but it's just not the primary. I mean, it's, it's immediately cleared by the immune system. It's not that they have that as their primary disease. They probably have primarily a tissue infection. 
and the systemic immune response syndrome develops in response to that tissue infection, and then they develop a sepsis and severe sepsis. The only studies that look specifically for positive blood culture are the ones that that's the endpoint. There, there was one meta-analysis that collected those. But no, most of the time, the infection is not primarily or specifically a positive blood culture or bacteremia. And in fact, many of the review articles, there's always, like every month it seems, there's a review article about markers of sepsis or PCT. They often bemoan the fact that we really don't have a good, clear-cut, objective, quantifiable definition of sepsis. Even though the Surviving Sepsis Campaign has been working very hard to find ways that we can help septic patients, and even though we all recognize that this is a really important issue in hospitalized patients, we don't have a really good, firm definition. Everybody uses the word a little bit differently. Can I ask one more question? Sure. We do, in my ICU, a lot of hypothermia for the neuro population, TBI, elevated ICP, retractable ICP, ICP, Lycox. And I was hoping that we could utilize procalcitonin during the five-day hypothermia process when we can't tell if they are having fever to track and trend if they are progressing to severe sepsis septic shock. Because a lot of our patients that are on this protocol are on pressors to drive their CPP up, and we can't really tell until they are very ill whether they're developing severe sepsis septic shock. What are your theories, or have, can you think about how the body would make procalcitonin if they were on a hypothermia protocol? Well, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think that anyone has looked at that specifically with procalcitonin, but there's no reason why procalcitonin shouldn't continue to be a useful marker in those patients. The fever that's part of the systemic immune response to infection or other stimulus for inflammation is driven by the cytokines, and although, you know, cooling the patient obviously helps, it doesn't necessarily stop the cytokines from being produced, and I don't think that that would stop the PCT from being produced. And a very common theme in all of the literature of procalcitonin, regardless of how people feel about its ability to predict the development of severe sepsis or make the diagnosis of sepsis, is that it's very well correlated with the degree of organ dysfunction. In other words, the more organ dysfunction, the more tissue injury there is, the higher the procalcitonin levels are. So I would think in that application it would continue to be useful. In fact, it would be really helpful because, as you said, you can't really rely on the traditional vital signs to sort of monitor the patient. Right. Well, I'm hopeful. We've done one patient over six days. We're going to keep doing it over and over to see what we get, to see if there's a way we can look at them differently with serial PCTs. Yeah, it's a, it's a great study that needs to be done, I think, if it hasn't already been done. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a question, Dr. Fay, that has, again, to do with some logistics. What is your turnaround time? The turnaround time is about, I would say, 40 minutes from receipt to report, and that's pretty close to from draw to report because the intensive care unit, and this is for the intensive care unit, obviously, which is the only site that I'm babysitting the test or monitoring the test, mm-hmm. is ordered in some other places. But those specimens are shot down in, in the pneumatic tube and are, are handled very expeditiously, so it's pretty close to draw to report. And we use a mini vitus for the procalcitonin. It's in the core laboratory facility where we do all the rest of the stat testing, and we also use that instrument for D-dimer, so it's basically the same turnaround time for the D-dimer that we provide. Okay. There's a couple of the questions in here that I'll apologize in advance if I'm not interpreting them correctly or they use some acronyms. Here's one that says, is PCT a STAT-eligible test? What is your expected TAT? Yeah, I think PCT is a STAT test. The way that I'm proposing that the ICUs use it is that it's immediate feedback that, yes, this patient is deteriorating. So, in other words, you you have a critically ill patient in the ICU. He or she is starting not to look too good. You're not sure exactly why. Just as you would think maybe I need to order blood cultures, you should order a PCT. And if the PCT is elevated, especially if it's increased over what it was yesterday or the day before, then that's a sign you have to do something. You have to implement some sort of intervention. 
that's up to the intensive care unit, but it's really, I think, a stat test because you want to get that information to them as soon as possible. And again, we hope to provide all this type of testing that is critical. I wish we could do it faster. We do have a lot of BOCT as well at Stanford, but we generally get these results back within 30 to 40 minutes of receiving the specimen. All right. Well, I think we may have exhausted all the questions then. Good questions. Yeah, they were. So if there are no more questions, I'd just like to say again on behalf of BioMario, thanks to Dr. Fay and all the participants for being with us today. There are two more webinars that we've got scheduled over the next couple of months. One of them is on June 29th, Tuesday, June 29th, and its focus will be on discussing PCT for the ER or critical care nursing setting. And then the third webinar is on July 14th regarding PCT use in the ICU and the emergency department. Again, we'll be sending reminder emails about those webinars, and if you can join us, we'd love to have you. Thank you again, Dr. Fay. Thanks to all the participants, and everyone have a nice day.